Welcome everyone to the Land and Wildlife Conservation Webinar as part of our Common Agenda Education Series. Thank you so much for joining us today as we go over our policy papers in ARC 2024 Common Agenda. Last week, we went over clean water and flood resilience policy, this week's land and wildlife chapter, and then next week will be the climate and energy chapter. So if you are interested in climate and energy policies as well, please, I encourage you to register and then join for that one too. All right, so we're going to dive deep into it. Pat, if you could take over, that would be great. Hey, Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Pat Calvert. I'm Director for Clean Water and Land Conservation with uh, VCN. Appreciate you joining today. And um, and for all of our um, our esteemed guest presenters here today, um, for the past several months, these folks have been working with other co-authors to draft um, our common agenda for 2024. Um, and today we're just going to, uh, these folks are going to provide with you brief synopsis of uh, focused on the policy recommendations for each of those papers as they apply to land and wildlife conservation. Um, we're gonna divide that into three sections, um, land conservation for first and then outdoor recreation. Um, and then we'll, we'll hit Virginia's flora and fauna. Um, and then after each of those sections, we'll allow an opportunity for a little Q and A with our co-authors here. Um, and, in the meantime, if you have particular questions, we encourage you to use the uh, the Q and A feature down at the bottom of your screen to um, to to put those questions in, and, and we'll have time to uh, we've set aside time in order to to allow those to be, be uh, um, verbally addressed. And if time runs out, then um, um, we'll ask the co-authors to address those, um, and also using the Q and A process. So without further ado, uh, we've, we've had a paper for the past few years really focused on um, our, our general asks um, for, for land conservation. This year is, um, uh, is being presented by co-author Alan Rousem of the Northern Virginia Conservation Trust. So I now hand the floor to Alan. Thanks, Pat. Appreciate it. Uh, appreciate being with everyone and being a part of the common agenda process again this year. I'm sorry a little bit for my failing voice. I think my my kids gave me something. I'm still trying to uh, trying to beat back. Um, but I was I was proud again to be working with a number of our our partners in on the session, investing in our Virginia's heritage and in, in in Virginia's heritage and future. Um, it's certainly these are programs that our land trust in Northern Virginia worked pretty specifically on, and um, and. And the uniqueness of Virginia's natural cultural heritage um, is something we all know is why we love to live here, why this Commonwealth is so unique, and why it's so important to protect. And and for so many reasons, both our economy, um, way of life, climate change, um, there's there's real uh, there's real need and a real urgency for us to be protecting that heritage and and conserving our future. Um, but so this section um, really gets into a number of the of the policy goals and proposals that underpin that support. Um, there are significant challenges, I think, in 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 conserving Virginia's heritage and future. Um, it really is a race against time with with development, with land conversion, with climate change, imperiling not only lands already protected, but those that hopefully will be protected in the future. Um, we know that we have a time a, a time limited amount um, uh, in front of us in order to to make a difference in our communities and the protected lands of Virginia um, really define who we are as a Commonwealth and um, unfortunately, despite that, Virginia ranks in the bottom ten states in the country in terms of percentage of budget spent on land conservation um, and so unless to, investing in land and water protection in many ways often seems like a luxury versus a necessity when it comes to the General Assembly. Um, and that's something we're working really hard to change and have a number of really critical programs that are proven to work um, that we know need further investment in. Um, why why does this matter? Why is it important for us to be, be conserving land and water for all time? I mean, our food sources, our wildlife, rural way of life throughout the Commonwealth, outdoor recreation opportunities are all at risk if we don't continue to protect critical places for all time. 
And history shows we never look back and regret decisions to safeguard our most important lands and waters. But it's really the initial courage and follow through from policymakers that can be hard to find. Um, and these conservation programs that help underpin that are, are no different. Um, it's also critical to fund land and water conservation now because of the unprecedented amount of federal funding available to leverage state funds. Um, over the next few years, um, through many different sources, um, there's never going to be a more important time for Virginia to be investing in land and water conservation because the federal government is doing the same. And when those dollars can be leveraged, when they can be built on each other, um, you can do incredible things with them. Um, but that money will go elsewhere. That federal money will go else elsewhere if other states are using it more strategically. And so it is it is a really important time for the state to meet um, the federal challenge of land conservation, of climate change, um, and to step up meeting goals, you know, toward protecting those most most precious lands and waters. Um, I, it's also important to note why it matters is that our conservation efforts over time have to acknowledge a historic disparity in allocation of resources and related impacts on many segments of the population, most notably Native peoples and broadly people of color. And so these programs that we, that we need more investment in are addressing conservation needs and opportunities present um, in many of these communities and, and is time for us to overcome past inequity and expand accessibility um, and provide protection of our land and waters that are important to us all. Um, and these funding goals allow us to do that. Um, our policy solutions, um, we know that more than 80% of land in Virginia is privately owned. And so tools and funding are needed for landowners to conserve that private land. And we do have very effective, very tried and true programs in Virginia that many states I think would be very lucky to have and would want to have that we need more investment in. And they are, um, we know they are effective. They, they have done incredible things throughout the Commonwealth over the past, you know, 20, 25 years or more. Um, and, and so investing in them is, is a known way that we can make a difference. These aren't new programs that um, need to be built or need to be proven they work. Um, I'm going to run through the program quickly. Folks can read um, the the um, the section in in our common agenda to look at them more deeply. But the land preservation tax credit. This is a program that just in the past year crossed over a million acres protected uh, in the Commonwealth. Um, is a critical program for the General Assembly to continue to fund. As is the Virginia Land Conservation Foundation. Essentially, our state land acquisition fund, grant acquisition fund, um, the Virginia Battlefield Preservation Fund, Black, Indigenous, and People of Color BIPOC Historic Preservation Fund, um, which is new over the last several years, but already proving to be a critical source of funding. And then the Virginia Outdoors Foundation's Get Outdoors program, which many of our organizations are using and, and a wonderful partner that VOF is in helping support and and grant out funding for many projects that land conservation organizations use across the Commonwealth. Um, those each of those programs have have very defined goals and and happy to walk through those during questions if people are interested. Um, but I think in um, in closing, these programs need to be funded well at, at a at an annual basis, but dedicated funding, reliable. Uh, funding is needed for each of these programs each year to provide certainty and to be able to plan for our communities and to create outdoor recreation infrastructure and conservation infrastructure. We need dedicated funding. On the federal level, that dedicated funding has now has now been found through the Great American Outdoors Act uh, several years ago, and Virginia needs a similar dedicated funding source. Um, there are a number of um, of efforts across the state. Um, that are specifically looking at dedicated funding, um, like our Virginia Outdoors, and we hope um, members of, of VCN will consider joining coalitions like that to build the voices that will create the dedicated funding we need to make a difference in our communities when it comes to land and water protection. Um, these essential programs, um, you know, really from pocket park to productive farmland, you know, all create what we know to be 
you know, the Virginia and the Commonwealth we want it to be. That includes urban conservation and underserved communities. Um, and so we know that we need to support these programs to really continue the fabric of what our communities are. Um, and so with that, I will turn it back over to Pat. I'm happy to answer any questions, but it was a pleasure to work on on this section of the book with Mike Kane from Piedmont Environmental Council and Beth Mizell from Blue Ridge, Blue Ridge Prism um, and look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thanks, Alan. Appreciate that. Um, along with much of what Alan just presented was um, agriculture and our, our uh, working farms, which are uh, critical. I eat every day. Um, I hope you do too, but uh, we, we need farms for more reasons than that. Um, and uh, I'm going to hand it right over to Kevin Tate with the Alliance for the Shenandoah Valley in the Red Basket of Virginia. Hey, everybody. Um, let me get to sharing my screen. How's that look? Great. There you go. All right. Start from the beginning. So uh, like Pat said, uh, my name is Kevin Tate. I'm with Alliance for the Shenandoah Valley. Um, I'm here to present a uh, policy paper or policy position specifically around preserving farmland. So everything that Alan just said, just kind of narrow it down a little bit into uh, specifically farmland preservation. Uh, it was great to work with our partners here in the Valley, uh, Valley Conservation Council to put this uh, policy position together. But I would just like to point out that um, this is not just a Valley, uh, Shenandoah Valley position and partners in land conservation from uh, Richmond, the Capital Region Land Conservancy and uh, Piedmont Environmental Council and some of our other partners around the state also contributed to uh, this paper, even though they don't have author credit. Um, so anyways, um, the major challenges, um, Virginia farms are incredibly important, not just for the food, and fiber that they provide, but uh, maintaining open space, sustaining wildlife habitat, uh, the opportunity and the actuality of mitigating floods, um, creating lots of jobs, uniting communities in many places. Uh, and they provide opportunities uh, for us in Virginia to meet other clean water, climate change and conservation goals. And while that's all true, um, and 40% of Virginia's farmland is in the category of nationally significant. So that's high quality soils um, that are significant specifically for agriculture purposes. Uh, Virginia also ranks seventh by American Farmland Trust uh, for the state with the most agriculture acres projected to be converted to other uses, uh, generally um, housing uh, by 2040. Um, in the meantime, one in 13 jobs in Virginia are tied to the agriculture industry. So um, again, not just the food and fiber, um, but broadly Virginia's economy based in agriculture and forestry. Um, and while we do have some programs like Alan mentioned at the end of his presentation uh, for protecting farmland, um, the the programs for localities, uh, usually called purchase of development right programs, are broadly underfunded in Virginia and in many cases overly, overly burdensome for uh, localities to participate in. And the other way to um, protect farmland besides direct farmland conservation through conservation easements is, you know, providing a, a system in which agriculture can thrive, where farms can be um, generate income and be an attractive model for uh, future farmers to take up as a career. And with that, um, we need further investment in local processing and um, local supply chains so that farms can retain uh, much of the value of the products that they produce. So some of the policy solutions um, that we suggest in this paper 
um, again, m broadly trying to limit conversion of, of agricultural lands, especially the highest quality agricultural lands to non-agricultural uses uh, in order to maintain all those things we talked about, open space, wildlife habitat, strong economic foundation, opportunities to meet other conservation goals. Um, what we suggest is lowering the the match requirement for localities to participate in purchase of development rights programs from 50% to 25%. Uh, so reducing that, that contribution that localities have to commit in order to access state funds and state programming. Um, similarly, to remove a co-holding requirement uh, for easements that are funded by the Virginia Land Conservation Fund um, that adds a layer of burden to localities uh, while we have many um, accredited and uh, very functional land trusts who can who can fill that role uh, on their own. We are suggesting $500,000 per year through the Office of Farmland Preservation to create purchase of development right programs in more counties throughout Virginia, uh, providing direction and um, locally led conservation efforts uh, in counties and in communities. Uh, we are suggesting $5 million a year for the Virginia Farmland Preservation Fund. Um, again, funding to directly conserve uh, farmland in conservation easements. And we are also suggesting $1 million a year for the Governor's Agriculture and Forestry Industry Development Fund, which could fund things like processing plants um, or local community driven um, supply chain steps so that our farms and our local communities can retain much of the value of the, the agricultural and forestry products created um, in their community. Um, this is my contact information as I was uh, directed to put at the end of this presentation. So please uh, feel free to contact me at any time uh, for more information or for more um, discussion on these issues. Uh, we're happy to do it. And with that, Pat, I don't know if there are any questions, um, but happy to take them. Yeah, um, please, if you have questions, drop them in the in the Q&A um, and we will address those right after our next presentation in this subchapter on land conservation. Uh, Max Hokett with American Battlefield Trust is going to discuss um, protecting historic and cultural resources in the Commonwealth. Hey there, folks. Um, sorry, I'm going just straight to video this time. Um, you know, um, Alan at the top of this section, you know, really laid a, a good groundwork. So I'm going to kind of follow in, in what he had to say because our papers do share a lot. Um, as you all know, Virginia has some of the most uh, maybe the greatest density of historic cultural sites of anywhere in the nation uh, and historically has been a leader in programs and funding for those programs that help us preserve those lands. Um, they've not always been perfect. And the programs, uh, one of the big things that our paper talks about is how both increase funding and, and Rodney who can, who can uh, access those programs is going to be sort of key for their future use. Uh, so, there's a few challenges. Just like I just said, you know, access to these funding streams and making them approachable for everybody is one of the big ones. Another thing that we are facing all the time is organizations trying to save historical and cultural sites is the rapidly increasing development pressure across the Commonwealth, um, you know, where a million dollars or $2 million in these programs five or 10 years ago could cover a lot of the demand we're seeing that, you know, single applications can be for as that entire funding for the year, um, you know, coming from a number of different organizations. On the plus side, there's also more money coming in from the federal side that can match some of these programs than there ever has been before. Um, obviously, me being with the American Battlefield Trust, we deal a lot with the Virginia Battlefield Protection Fund and VLCF that money can get matched with the American Battlefield Protection Program at the federal level. That's now at $20 million a year when it used to be about two. So there's a lot of money that can be brought into the state. Uh, there's, of course, there's the 
sort of matching grant fund programs like VLCF, like VBPF. There's a couple other tools and new tools in question here. Uh, the historic rehabil rehabilitation, I'm sorry, historic rehabilitation tax credit is another very essential tool uh, that this community uses all the time. Um, urban and rural communities can use this to uh, be a real catalyst in development, redevelopment, and uh, to reuse older structures. And it's one of those, like like a lot of these programs, you know, uh, for each dollar invested, there's a lot coming back out of it. Uh, our paper, we cite the economic impact for every dollar of the tax credit is four to five dollars in return. Um, and then, of course, there's the newer program, uh, the BIPOC fund, as we've shortened, shortened it for the most part here, um, which has been funded uh, at five million a year in this first budget, and we're hoping to see that maintained uh, at ten million over the next biennium. Uh, and you know that program is still sort of growing into uh, what it's going to be. This is really in the first couple, you know, first budget cycle that's existed. So we're going to um, see how that can be developed out, funded, you know, fully staffed appropriately, all those things. So you know, there's there's a lot of balancing things going on here. We have more demand for these funds than we've ever seen. We have more pressure being put on them through the increased prices of land and the increased rate of development. We're all familiar with how, you know, data centers and warehouse distribution centers, all these different kinds of things have just skyrocketed prices. Um, and so our policy recommendations uh, focus in strong funding for these programs. Um, so we're calling for 30 million a year for VLCF, which would of course be a really significant increase and, and would open a lot of avenues to bring in federal dollars matching with that, um, make a lot of new acquisitions. And we're ad advocating for 5 million per year for the Virginia Battlefield Protection Fund. Um, along with that, we're calling for 5 million per year for the Virginia BIPOC Historic Preservation Fund, which I mentioned that's it had in this most recent calendar year but um it's you know we want to get that consistent and set a tone that that program needs to be funded consistently and at, at least that level um and of course maintaining the historic rehabil rehabilitation tax credit program uh and we're also specifically mentioning and this is something that i think we've you know from discussions and writing this paper and discussions within vcn as we've you know moved through this process you know, we've, we've said for a couple of years in this paper that we want to make sure that we're looking at these programs, particularly VLCF, but I think it really applies you know, to all of them, and find ways to make them more accessible for preservation of sites that highlight Virginia's diverse cultural history. And I think that's something we're still wrestling with. What is the right, you know, how to do that successfully? It's not an easy thing. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing it, but I think that's something that as a community of conservationists we can keep talking about and you know, want input and feedback on. Um, so, you know, our, we're mostly here to talk about funding uh, requests and, but, you know, just want to reiterate that Virginia just has a nearly unmatched level of these historic cultural sites as a battlefield organization. We're always telling folks about how over half the land we've preserved in the whole country is in Virginia. Uh, there's 122 Civil War battlefields alone, and that's just our corner of the much larger world of you know, historic preservation across the state. So, um, yeah, like everyone else, uh, I'm very happy to answer questions during the Q&A. Uh, my info is in the chat, and I'll be sticking around. Thanks, Max. Um, so if you have any questions, um, we, we have left an a, a opportunity here for you to, to use the... Uh, Ask those in the Q&A button down below. At this point, I do not have any questions um, for our panelists. I guess you did just such a good job. There's no questions. I answered them all. Well, I should um, I with Castell me. I fill out that one. <laughs> Shout out Preservation Virginia. There you go. Well, with that, um, we'll, we'll move on to our next subchapter then. Um, 
outdoor recreation certainly since um, the the COVID epidemic um, and the the need uh, for folks to get outdoors and to um, find ways to stay uh, safely um, active and engaged um, blew up, um, and a lot of efforts have have um, have have really gotten some some charge um, towards outdoor recreation. So we've got two specific papers um, this year that are, I'm sorry, um, three. Um, no, I'm sorry, sorry, I was right, two. Uh, two papers that really, I think, are focused on, on outdoor recreation, although multiple papers uh, broach the, the topic. One uh, paper, um, we're joined today by Kyle Lawrence of the Shindo Valley Bicycle Coalition, um, is on investing in conservation and outdoor recreation. So without further ado, it's all yours, Kyle. Thanks, Pat. Let me share my screen here. And we see it. Got it. Great. OK, well, thank you. I will warn you, if I have to mute myself, please jump in. It's because there's a train behind this wall here, and you won't hear anything. Um, all right. Well, thanks, everyone. I'm Kyle Lawrence with the Shenandoah Valley Bicycle Coalition. I'm here in Harrisonburg in the Shenandoah Valley. And our paper, uh, you can see our other authors here, Elliot Caldwell with the East Coast Greenway Alliance, and Justin Doyle with James River Association, is about investing in conservation and outdoor recreation. So if we take a look, I think um, the big picture is certainly about funding. But I think if we step back and, and think about why funding, there's a bunch of reasons. Alan gave a great intro to why funding is important right now, given that there's a lot of federal funds that can be leveraged. So we want to make sure we're talking about that. But I think big picture, it's about connecting people to nature and to the outdoors. So thinking about how we can ensure that we can get people to these outdoor spaces uh, in addition to conserving them. And so I know for us, like just a local story here in the Valley, we do a lot of work trying to make the national forest more accessible. So we have a ton of acres of national forest land, the George Washington National Forest, and not a ton of facilities in terms of um, well-placed parking lots, accessible trails, things like that. So I think about how we can, we can statewide make places that already exist more accessible and of course acquire new ones. So the big, the big challenge here is that while we have lots of great outdoor spaces in Virginia, too many Virginians um, lack great access to public lands and waterways. Um, barriers can include the, the distance and also the facilities. And there's also an equity problem in that we know that not everyone has equal access to the outdoors. So looking at targeted ways we can um, you know, close that gap and ensure more people have access to those outdoor public spaces. And so the big picture challenge, of course, is the funding. And so there is has been funding in Virginia, but it's been inconsistent. And so the, the big challenge is not having that consistent annual funding. Um, we have these you know, boom and bust cycles of funding our outdoor recreation um, and even conservation efforts. So uh, Virginia's spending is towards the bottom compared to other states for natural resources. So that's something we really wanna focus on um, fixing. So what are we proposing? We'll certainly dedicate funding as the number one piece, but that's really a long-term strategy. Um, it's unlikely that you get dedicated funding uh, in one uh, general assembly cycle. So thinking about how we can um, start to put those pieces in place. Uh, we recommend a statewide study or interagency and interagency work group to look at different mechanisms for natural for funding natural resources. And I think that could be you know, such a range of things. We can look at how the state can help with matching funds or federal grants. We can look at technical assistance and of course, look at just directly funding more of these programs and increasing the funding for the programs. In addition, um, Virginia has an office of outdoor recreation, but there isn't a current director. So one of our recommendations was to appoint a director for that office, knowing that it would make a big difference in moving things forward, coordinating um, the various uh, conservation outdoor recreation pieces that happen in Richmond and have to happen between the state agencies. 
And finally, outdoor recreation, of course, has a, a very positive economic impact on the state. And so this idea of pulling together a study, um, ideally led by Virginia Tourism, BTC Virginia Tourism Corporation, so that we can look at what the impact of outdoor recreation is on Virginia's economy. And that would be a powerful piece to make the case for why this is important. And we know it's important for reasons beyond economic value, but we also know that sometimes you need, you need that data in order to convince uh, policymakers and elected officials um, that this is where they need to invest their funding. So I think the big picture is securing dedicated funding. There's some small steps we can do in the process. And I have to certainly mention um, our Virginia Outdoors, which is a great coalition of organizations working on dedicated funding. So I think that it's super important. We wanna connect more people to the outdoors. As Pat said, uh, the COVID pandemic, the outdoors are booming and we need to make sure uh, they're booming for everyone and everyone has uh, equal access. So, Again, I'm Kyle Lawrence with the Shenandoah Valley Bicycle Coalition. There's my content info, and thanks, everyone. Thank you, Kyle. Um, we'll, we'll share the uh, link for our Virginia Outdoors in the in the uh, chat below. But at this point, um, I also don't have any questions um, posed because I guess you're just too good at this. Um, that's not a bad thing. So, without further ado. Um, and if you have questions, um, feel free to put, drop those in there if something comes up. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to move right on to uh, Virginia's flora and fauna. Um, um, and we've got multiple papers um, this year. One that uh, has been a uh, evergreen um, issue for the past several years, uh, pun intended, would be our tree canopy. Um, Ann Jerzyk with Chesapeake Bay Foundation is here today. Uh, to just to um, uh, tell us about the Assessing Virginia's Tree Canopy Loss paper. Thanks, Pat. All right, just give me a give me a thumbs up that you can see my screen. Yes, okay, good to go. Um, so thanks, everybody. I'll just say many of you have very kindly worked on this issue for the last several years, and um, I just can't thank you enough for that. Um, we've worked hard to, uh, particularly to preserve and enhance Virginia's tree canopy. Like that's that's been the topic of our um, of our paper for years past, and our efforts have really centered around trying to get to give local governments additional authority because right now they're pretty hamstrung. Right, they have very limited authority to require developers to replace the canopy that they that. Um, is cut during de the development process. And we, you know, we've introduced legislation, I'll just say, probably for the last three to four years along those lines. And we we run into this buzzsaw, which is like it, we call house, county, cities, and towns. And it just has not been a very friendly subcommittee for us to bring these bills in front of. And we we typically get um, routinely shot down in that particular committee. So this year we said, well, why don't we try to do something that we know we've got some bipartisan support for, and that is to do a, a, a technical tree canopy assessment. So I'm going to talk just a little bit more about that. Let's see. There we go. Um, yeah, so the, the challenges that we've got right now, I mean, we're in Virginia, we're losing about, on average, we've lost 9,500 acres of, um, of forest over the last four years. And this is using uh, new one meter resolution data that has come from the USGS. Uh, and you, you think about that one meter, that's a little over a yard. And it's um, you can tell the difference between a tree and a shrub at that level of resolution, right? And um, and we're really not that concerned about silviculture, right? The harvest of trees, um, because even though they may replant it with a you know with pine, it's not too horrible from a water quality perspective or from a habitat perspective. But it's not great um, if those trees aren't. I mean, if the trees are are not replanted, right? 
So what does concern us is the increasing amount of impervious surface that's going along that's happening at the same time as the tree loss. And, you know, you may have read this past week, I guess, that may, might have been two weeks ago, but the Bay Journal did a great article, you know, and it was about the not just the loss of canopy in each of the watershed states, but also the increase in impervious surfaces. Interesting, Loudoun County, you know, listed in the top five with a, with an increase of 2,200 acres of impervious surface. So, you know, that's those are driveways, parking lots, et cetera, buildings where the water just can't soak in anymore. And of course, those that pavement's not providing any ecosystem services from the, you know, from a habitat perspective. They're not, it's not cleaning the air, it's not cleaning the water, just not doing us a whole lot of good from a, a health of, um, natural resources or from a human perspective. So, you know, over the last, over the last five years, we have converted within the entire watershed the same area as, as the District of Columbia from forest and tree canopy to impervious surfaces. So that's an, that's really an alarming prospect if you think about that trend continuing it's um if you, and you think about that particularly in the terms of climate change it's pretty alarming and something that we really want to to address so you know some of the challenges we that we've got are that legislators particularly ones who were in southwest virginia who tend to be the ones who are sitting on that house county seas and towns um subcommittee they don't see it as a problem you know, they're like, I, we got acres and acres and miles and miles of trees where we are. Um, also, Virginia is a very strong property rights state, right? You know, north of us in, in the District of Columbia, you have to apply for a permit to remove a tree off a of private property. You can imagine that's probably not ever going to happen in the state of Virginia. But also, and the other speakers have, have spoken to this issue, we've got really, we've got a lot of competing land use priorities, right? We've got, we need affordable housing. So where are we going to house people? We need, um, we need infrastructure, we, whether that's, you know, utility scale solar or transmission lines to connect those to transformers. So all we know that all of that is needed, but just how do you do it in a, um, in a thoughtful manner? So, pitch down. So what we are asking for this coming year is really just a, a technical study because in, in this year, in 2023, the USGS will release a new data set that compares, um, that will compare the, that will look at loss and land use changes over the last four years. So it'll look at from 2018 to 2022. And what we're asking to happen is to do a comparison of that new data set with the 2014 to 2018 data set and look at not just the differences, but let's determine what is causing, we know where and we know the land use changes, but what we don't understand is the why behind it. So let me give you one quick example. Um, you know, we think about invasive species and we say, well, you know, maybe uh, there's some parts of the state where invasive species are, are tearing down trees, but we really don't think about the bugs, right? But in Harrisonburg, right, they lost approximately 20% of their canopy to the emerald ash borer. That's a lot of trees. That's a lot of canopy. That may not, and it could be the development, you know, is it, what does that development look like? I mean, it, we've got some partners who say, well, it's all data centers. It might be in Loudoun County, but that might be very different in other parts of the state. So what does that development mix look like? And then I think we can be able to pull together since those um, uses vary a lot by geography, we ought to be able to come together with some um, policy suggestions as a result of this report. Um, so here's my contact information. I just want, I want to do one quick plug, which is in our paper, there is a link to, um, to you, fact sheets for every county and city in Virginia and so you can click on the link in our white paper and it will take you to, and then you can just sort of find what the tree loss was in your locality. 
share that with your local leaders because we can't get, all of us can't get tree policy changed unless our local governments ask for it. In other words, why go to the General Assembly and say, yeah, we want to give local governments additional authority if the local governments are not, you know, walking hand in hand with us asking for it. So I encourage you to share those fact sheets with your local elected leaders so that they'll be our, our legislative partners as we go into this upcoming General Assembly session. And I'm also happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. And I will stop sharing. Thanks, Ann. Um... I, I appreciate that. I, I kind of got lost in the trees when I when I moved over to the um, the, the the sub chapter on flora and fauna, and I mistakenly uh, moved past our second paper on outdoor recreation. So my apologies to Josh Stutz with Friends of James River Park, um, but something very important and dear to our hearts, um, particularly since he represents the crown jewel of uh, Richmond. Um, the James River Park System um, is strengthening our park funding. So uh, thanks for letting me screw up a little bit, Josh. It's all yours now. Thanks, Pat. Really appreciate that. Uh, no, thank you all for letting me be a part of this today. Uh, as, as Pat said, I represent the James River Park System, which is in Richmond. Um, and uh, one of the things that we see, and it's really Pat hit the nail on the head and, and sort of Kyle with the number of additional people we see in the park. And that made me made me think of the we did a study that talked about the height at the pandemic and looked at who was coming to the park and people visited the James River Park from uh, 49 out of 50 states 2700 unique zip codes visited the James River Park in 2021 so really just incredible close to 4 million individual visits to the park incredible amount of traffic for uh, a park that doesn't get uh, nearly enough funding from our, our city partners. Um, so that's what we're here to talk about. Uh, inconsistent park funding is uh, is a constant problem. It's something we're seeing on a lot of places. State parks have close to a half a quarter of a billion dollars in backlog of maintenance projects. Um, so deferred maintenance is becoming a real issue um, for our parks. And so um, one thing we want to make sure we are staying cognizant of is that there, there are Josh, you are muted. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry. My, my, my screen's doing all kinds of weird stuff. I apologize. You're back. All right. <laughs> Can you see my screen still? Cannot. Cannot. Okay. Let me see what I can do about that. Sorry, guys. I'm working on a different computer than I normally work on. Josh, for some reason it's not showing up. So I'm gonna try sharing my screen with your presentation if that's all right. That'd be great, thanks. No problem. Oh wait, actually it is working. Well, I think you got it. All right, can everyone, okay. So we're back, can you hear me? Okay, cool, thanks. I'm sorry guys, all kinds of weird stuff happening. Anyway, competing priorities, cities uh, like Richmond in particular, that's where I work. Have, uh, have things like schools, roads, fire departments, all kinds of things to pay for. And it's it sometimes can be tough to make the case that public parks need the investment that, that they deserve, um, especially when if you, if you don't fund a park for a little bit of time, it's still there, it's outdoor space, right? So in a lot of people's minds, if you're not real familiar, that can be a tough case to make. Um, lack of pu public awareness contributes to that issue. Uh, and, and we're always having to make the case for increased funding. And then uh, in, in uh, inconsistent funding has led to decreased maintenance and programming budgets. That's a real serious issue. You know, it's just like uh, with your car, you got to do the annual maintenance, you got to do the oil change, or you run into real serious problems. And some of our state parks in particular are starting to see that. Uh, we are proposing $57 million per year for the DCR state parks uh, to support essential staffing programming and to help address that backlog of maintenance issues. Um, promoting the creation of a statewide outdoor access equity model with stakeholder input through DCR, uh, $5 million per year for the Virginia Outdoor Foundation for Get Outdoors grants. Those are, we, we've received Get Outdoors grants. They're great for local projects, $25,000 a piece, usually uh, really equity driven focused stuff. We love that. Um, and that helps encourage additional, out, uh, additional funding locally. And then establishing a, a matching grant program to be facilitated by DCR to encourage localities to make those investments. 
Um, you know, we, we find with our city partners that if there's some kind of match they can get from the state, it's really easy to get them to put additional funding in. They all want the wins. It's just uh, in that, you know, they got to find that justification, that little thing to sweeten the pot. And those matching funds can be a real boon for that. So um, thank you all for, for letting me be a part of this. That's my contact info. Um, and please let me know if you guys uh, need anything from us. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Um, and at this point, I also have no questions. You guys are just knocking it out. Um, I will um, drop in here the uh, website for our, our Virginia Outdoors Coalition. I see Maribel is in, uh, on our participant list today. She is the coordinator for that. It would be, I'm sure, happy to speak with anybody uh, about, about that um, initiative. So let's see, maybe, maybe I have a Q&A here. Ah. Here's a question. I'm not certain who this might be for, but um, probably Anne. Uh, the question is: There's specific funding to remove autumn olives, which is a, a an invasive tree, uh, but to remove those from agricultural land. Um, I was talking to Blair Blanchett earlier today. Funny that you ask. And there's um, Blue Ridge Prism is about ready to start a new work group to to evaluate and to set up a strategy to address different invasive species. And I don't know that um, autumn olive is necessarily gonna be, um, you know, at the, the top of the list. I don't, because I'm not setting the state's priorities for that, but I know that there's a new work group starting to address those. Thank you, Ann. We've got a number of partners who, who work on, on invasives, um, including native uh, Virginia Native Plant Society, Blue Ridge Prism, and many others. I know I will be leaving some out um, uh, in that. Apologies in advance for that. But um, uh, if there are any other questions, ask and you shall receive. Um, how will VCN track the recommendations of these papers? Good question. So, um, uh, we work with our legislative committee at VCN to look at every one of these policy asks and uh, make certain that we are mobilized to, if it's a legislative ask, if it's a budget ask, uh, to organize around those those items and to make certain that partners are combined um, and, and and that it it doesn't just kind of end up on a paper and, and go away. We'll we'll follow through that. Um, um, and our legislative committee is pretty active, but we'll um, certainly be doing it on a several times a week throughout the general assembly session beginning in January. But um, as we as we move towards that, partners are already working on on much of the campaigns um, at this point. You maybe heard every seat in the general assembly is up for election, um, and um, so we'll know a bit more about who actual electeds will be. So if it requires legislative um, work, then Right now is the time to do that outreach and engagement and education of, of electeds and um, candidates. If you have opportunities to meet with those candidates in your in your um, in your district um, or beyond, wherever your organization works or wherever you happen to live, um, this is great book to carry with you. Um, uh, the, the, our common agenda to just educate legislators. We're going to have a whole lot of new faces in the General Assembly, and they're not. many of them are not going to be familiar or, or maybe just barely familiar with some of the issues that we'll be discussing. So um, if they don't hear from you and your organizations that this is important to you, then they won't know. Um, and then I think Ann um, is, is providing some sage advice here. The governor's um, proposed biennial budget, since Virginia only has a two-year budget, uh, will be presented by the governor on December 20th. And if you want something funding-wise, particularly in that budget, then now is the time that you should be reaching out to the administration um, to, to express your priorities. Um, so, and one other question here, Josh, do you know of any local organizations in Richmond that are working to establish more green spaces or parks in socially slash economically disadvantaged areas? Um, there are quite a few different groups. Um, of course, we're always focused on expanding the James River Park system, which is touching on some of those areas. Um, Southside Relief um, is doing some work. Um, I know 
Capitol Trees is a lot of work going to increase green space and add add new trees in different parts of the city. Um, Richmond's got a really great community of different different people going around town doing that type of work. I know right now I was just meeting with a group yesterday about how to increase green space in Manchester. Um, that's that's a big topic. Um, there is not enough space there. Every empty lot is so so ripe for commercial development there. It's really tough to pull in green space there. And I know uh, the city's doing everything it can to to grow those plots. Thanks. Uh, I'm gonna drop, yeah, I was just going to say I'm going to drop a link, another link in the chat and it's for um, Reforest Richmond. Um, you know, it's a group led by Daniel Klein, but um, Arbor Day in RVA is, I, I think, October 14th through the 25th. I may have my dates a little wonky, but I know we've got CBF has a planting on the 21st and a planting on the 28th in Richmond. So um, and both of those are in um, heat island areas. One is the Oak Grove Playground and the other is Jefferson Park. So I'll drop that link and you guys, if you're interested, can sign up to plant trees. That's why I skipped ahead to the tree section, Ann, because there's just so much related to everything that you just discussed. It was completely intentional. All right, now we're going to go back to the Virginia's flora and fauna subsection. Um, and um, thanks to Ann for discussing Virginia's tree canopy, but uh, we've got some uh, wildlife habitat and, and fisheries um, items that we would like to address as well. Um, Jessica Roberts with Wild Virginia um, is here to discuss connecting our wildlife habitats. Thank you, Pat. Let me just share my screen. All right, great. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Jessica Roberts. I am the new director of Habitat Connectivity at Wild Virginia. So on this list of authors you see here, I'm replacing David Sly. He's taking over our water quality section and I'm taking over the Habitat Connectivity. So I wasn't actually involved in writing this paper, but very, very familiar with all this information. And I'm here standing in for also Laura at Piedmont Environmental Council and Aaron Cito at Wildlands Network. So some of the challenges, I broke it down in terms of terrestrial and aquatic passage in Virginia, but I am going to tell you about the connections between them as well. So first of all, challenges with terrestrial passage in Virginia. Um, as environmental organizations, we love to talk about the benefits to biodiversity, especially resilience for their populations in, in terms of in the face of challenges with anthropogenic change. But we also need to consider what um, makes the most sense in terms of galvanizing support. And so in terms of this, this would be wildlife vehicle conflict or enhancing driver safety in Virginia. We can combine that with the biodiversity benefits as well. So for terrestrial wildlife, wildlife vehicle conflict. So this includes direct crashes with wildlife, but also kind of swerving around them and uh, getting into a crash. So anything in it that involves wildlife um, and results in medical or personal property costs. It costs Americans around 8 billion every year, specifically for Virginia. We are the ninth highest in the state, uh, sorry, in the nation for wildlife vehicle conflict. So you have a one in 78 chance of hitting an animal every time you go out on the road. This, the highest known wildlife vehicle conflict is deer. So every year in Virginia, we've tracked this and we have more than 60,000 known deer vehicle collisions. And this costs the Commonwealth and its citizens um, around 533 million each year. So very costly in terms of um, driver safety and um, there are benefits to wildlife as well. For the aquatics, um, a wonderful organization, the North Atlantic Aquatic Connectivity Collaborative, has this database where they've monitored around 2,500 um, 2, stream crossings throughout Virginia between 2015 and 2023, and just about 60% of them have some kind of fish uh, barrier so anywhere from a minor barrier to a severe barrier. And when combining terrestrial and aquatic passage, we can really combine their needs and benefits when we're, we're asking for policy changes, right? So if we want to improve infrastructure, things like culverts and bridges, this can have benefits to aquatic organism passage as well as terrestrial passage. So they're not completely separate from each other, their challenges are linked. 
And then I just wanted to talk about a little bit about our past successes and where a lot of our needs this year are coming from based off of past legislation. So in 2020, Virginia was among the first states to enact legislation to protect habitat connectivity and wildlife corridors. This legislation required collaboration between state agencies like the Virginia Department of Transportation and Department of Wildlife Resources to make what was called the Wildlife Corridor Action Plan, which was published this past this year in 2023. And some benefits of this plan were it's going to help identify wildlife corridors and existing or planned threats to wildlife movement and also recommending priority areas for wildlife corridors based off of biodiversity and any kind of vehicle, uh, wildlife vehicle conflict. However, a lot of the language in this legislation um, as part of VDOT's environmental review process measures, they said in this language measures will be considered to mitigate uh, harm caused by road projects to terrestrial and aquatic wildlife passage. They will be considered, but not required. So there is no legislation requiring VDOT to imp implement these mitigation tactics in Virginia. So because of this, if we look to the second um, um, uh, solution I have here. So we need, because we don't have this language right, um, requiring VDOT to have some kind of mitigation for these types of wildlife vehicle conflict and biodiversity corridors, we want to create a regulatory framework that requires VDOT to include wildlife passage in known connectivity hotspots. So again, where there's that conflict and also that by all those uh, um, like concentration of biodiversity. Um, so whenever bridge or culvert improvement projects are planned, basically. So this goes hand in hand again with terrestrial and aquatic passage. They can have benefits to both. So we really want to have some side of some kind of triggering mechanism to get to have VDOT be required to do this. So this can be around wildlife vehicle conflict. So where at a certain level of wildlife vehicle conflict, maybe we are requiring VDOT to include these mitigation tactics. So it could be around this type of wildlife vehicle conflict. It also could be around other types of regulations like flood regulations. We're going to be experiencing increased flooding in Virginia. So at a certain level of flooding, we can require VDOT to improve their bridges and their culverts. And this can have overlaying and effects on our aquatic and terrestrial passage. So there are many different ways that we can sort of try to implement this triggering mechanism and this regulatory framework that requires VDOT to do this. And then we need the money, right? We we need the money to be able to do these types of projects. So we really want to create a wildlife quarter grant fund appropriating that five million over the biennium um, to give more money to VDOT and the Department of Natural Resources for more fencing culvert improvements and other crossing projects. So the picture that I'm showing you right here is from Bridget Donaldson. She is with the Virginia Transportation Research Council, does really wonderful research all over Virginia in terms of crossings and improving transportation infrastructure projects. And this project was along I-64 west of Charlottesville. They put fencing to direct animals to two existing underpasses that were not originally designed for wildlife. And she had cameras up before and after the input of this fencing. And just some results from this type of research, we found that after fencing installation, deer crossings increased around 400% with the culverts and 71% at the bridges. And it, it resulted in an average reduction in vehicle crashes of 92%. Other wildlife also had a 200% increase in using these underpasses. And they estimated this to result in an average savings of more than 2.3 million per site over a lifetime of each fence. So we can we have the data on how these fencing and these infrastructure improvement products really help in terms of driver safety and biodiversity. And we just now need the funding to be able to increase these projects um, with the Wildlife Quarter Action Plan, we are starting to highlight priority areas. Now we need the funding to be able to do this. So if you have any questions, please do feel free to contact me at jessica at wildvirginia.org. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. You can also just hang on here and ask her uh, in just a couple of minutes. Um, after we get to the next presentation, which I'm not going to skip, um, our next presentation is from Brent Hunziger of Friends of the Rappahannock, um, and he's got multiple fishies to talk about uh, to make certain that our fisheries in Virginia are sustainable. It's all yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Brent Hunziger. I'm with Friends of the Rappahannock. I'm going to talk to you all today about ensuring sustainable fisheries in the Commonwealth. 
First of all, thank you to the VCN staff for everything they do and pulling off these webinars along with all the other things they do to herd, as, as they say, herd the cats. So you all do an excellent job. We appreciate it. Um, also, I'd like to thank um, my co-author on this paper, uh, Chris Moore from Chesapeake Bay Foundation, very much a driving force behind uh, a few of the topics in this paper. Another thing I did want to note is that there was uh, some questions about the policy asks and um, the fact that this, this, some of these papers are generated in the middle of the year is the fact that some of the policy asks that you see here might actually never make it to the General Assembly. Oftentimes things change over time and new asks uh, are made uh, you know, leading up to the General Assembly. So it's, it's a moving target oftentimes. So uh, speaking about ensuring sustainable fisheries, um, it's important to note that our bay fisheries are really important for us both culturally and economically. Um, in Virginia, we have struggled uh, with managing and rebuilding many fish species, um, especially things like uh, iconic species such as blue crabs, river herring, American shad, striped bass, uh, menhaden, and uh, blue catfish. So some of those we would like to manage to get rid of, some of them we want to build their stocks. Um, also, we, we wanna kind of talk about, um, you know, the growing prevalence of new land uses, uh, the move from the reliance on groundwater to surface water and the impacts of climate change, how it's uh, going to necessitate prioritizing investment and better and better understanding of the cumulative impacts um, of water withdrawals on the, in, on the changes in our fisheries. So um, blue crabs. Data from 2022, the 2022 blue uh, dredge survey that's done every winter indicated this year that the lowest number of blue crabs since the survey was done started in 1989, they do it annually, was found in this particular, this past dredge survey. Luckily this year, we've seen modest increases in the amount of crabs this year, but still well below the thresholds that we would like to see them at. It is important to note that blue crabs are a species that has seen ups and downs and fluctuations in its population over time to uh, general factors, some natural factors, but uh, we are seeing a extended period of low populations, particularly right now, as we uh, struggle to get those populations up over time. And this is from, uh, you know, environmental factors such as water pollution, the loss of submerged aquatic vegetation where these, these crabs reproduce and spend a lot of time. But also there's concern about the excess amount of crabbing gear that is using being used to harvest blue crabs. Um, dealing with menhaden, uh, fisheries managers, recreational anglers, environmental groups, and researchers in the, in the last few years have raised concern about the amount of menhaden being harvested in the Chesapeake Bay. There is some concern over the localized depletion of menhaden in the Chesapeake Bay. It's important to note that the stocks coast wide on the East Coast are found to be healthy. So when we're talking about menhaden in this particular situation, there is, we feel the open question about whether or not there is localized depletion in Virginia waters inside the Chesapeake Bay. Um, the issue is that there's not enough data specific enough to the population of Menhaden in the Chesapeake Bay and that uh, more current data is needed to better understand if there is localized depletion occurring from uh, climate change and the Menhaden reduction fishery. Uh, dealing with water withdrawals. Um, currently, the impacts of water withdrawal intakes are analyzed on a permit by permit basis. Um, and what we don't know is what the impacts of all the existing water intakes, surface water intakes are on the waterways, both permitted intakes and non-permitted intakes. So these are the just a few of the uh, issues surrounding some of the fishery situations that we are concentrating on for this coming General Assembly. There are more. Um, there are others such as trying to increase funding for the processing and creating a market for blue catfish. That was not in this paper, but that was in last year's paper. If you would like more information, you can certainly ask and we will provide more information on that. So some of the policy recommendations that we are gonna be making coming up include um, 
asking the General Assembly uh, to fund a three-year pilot program from the general fund for crab pot tagging. Uh, crab pot tagging would ensure the appropriate amount of gears being deployed when catching crabs and would allow VMRC to gauge effectiveness of such a program. Um, subject to uh, Senate Bill 1388, which was the localized depletion study bill for Menhaden, we um, are asking the General Assembly to allocate funds to VIMS that are necessary to complete a comprehensive Menhaden stock assessment in partnership with Bay Region Management Bodies and Menhaden scientists. This would be a comprehensive study on the economic importance as well as the ecological importance and many other factors of, of the Menhaden inside the Chesapeake Bay. And this would be what we have seen to be up to a three-year study. And it will need approximately 2.7 million is what I the last number I've seen. Um, so quite a bit of money. Um, we need a DEQ to enforce federal regulations in implementing 316B, section 316B of the Clean Water Act for cooling water intakes at power plants to reduce the impacts on fish populations. Um, and then finally, um, we need to look into having uh, having the General Assembly fund a study um, through DEQ and VIMS on the cumulative impacts of existing and proposed permitted and non-permitted surface water withdrawal intakes in the Rappahannock, York, and James River systems that would help us assess the, the basin-wide comprehensive mortality of th that is occurring on fish larvae and eggs and then we could use those results to inform our very specific permitting decisions that come before DEQ and the other bodies that help issue and decide whether or not those intake permits should be issued. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brent. Um, so we do have a question. And if you have any more questions, uh, this is your last opportunity uh, to, to, to ask those. But um, um, question is how are the priority areas being delineated for wildlife crossings that are to be implemented with current limited funding um, and then are there studies from local organizations being taken into consideration Jessica Thank you want to take that one? question yeah that's a great question so right now WCAP so the wildlife quarter action plan is the main way that state agencies are trying to prioritize these areas. So we have data from police reports in terms of uh, wildlife vehicle conflict, and we have wonderful data on biodiversity corridors. So we're trying to combine those two data sets to create these nexus areas. And they already have these nexus areas outlined in the wildlife corridor action plan. They just are a little bit rough in terms of exact locations and exact culverts and exact bridges that we need to improve for this habitat co connectivity. So that is the next step of the Wildlife Corridor Action Plan is we're getting now into the weeds. We're, we're, we're combining data sets with, um, I always forget it, NAC, the, the North Atlantic Atlantic Connectivity Collaborative, the ones that are doing these wonderful assessments on culverts and bridges in terms of aquatic and terrestrial passage. So the next step of WCAP is to include that type of data into this wonderful data set that we already have. So we can then prioritize the culverts and the bridges that need to be improved the most. Right now, um, I am one of the leaders of the Virginia Safe Wildlife Corridors Collaborative, which is including state agencies, individual organizations, lots of nonprofit organizations, and we are helping with this data set. So our, one of my main priorities right now is to make this data set more robust, including studies from local organizations. So I love the study in Loudoun County with Jordan Green at DWR and Alexa Busby from William & Mary. They're doing a wonderful job in Loudoun County with their citizen science initiatives and all of their studies. That type of data I would love to include in this huge data data set that we're creating. It's just we're still in the beginning processes of this. Excellent. And thanks for the question, Trinity. Um, if somebody is interested in becoming part of the collaborative, um, what should they do? They can email me, jessica at wildvirginia.org, and I will add you to the collaborative. We have our next meeting is November 13th. It is going to be virtual. Um, and so 
I can give you all the details of that and we can have a really, and actually Loudoun County folks are coming to give a presentation on their research projects at the our next collaborative meeting. So we can have a, a lovely discussion about that. Great. Well, I'm not seeing any more Q&A in the box, um, but I, I want you to hang on for just a second. I want to thank all of our presenters today um, and for all your work in co-authoring uh, these policy papers and presenting what you've come up with. Now the hard work begins really and has begun um, in, in almost all these cases, I think, of really trying to make these policies uh, bring them to life. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Andriano with uh, VCN. Thank you so much, Pat, and thank you to all of our wonderful speakers today. Definitely feel much more knowledgeable on the policies that we're pursuing for General Assembly this year. And uh, I just put in the chat the four major topics I'll be talking about today. So this webinar is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. That'll be youtube.com slash at VA Conservation Network, link in chat. Uh, it'll also be sent out to email. So if you're not subscribe to our newsletter or anything like that, I definitely recommend doing so. Uh, the second thing is that for our upcoming webinars, next week is Climate and Energy Policy, and that will be on October 19th, followed by our Good Governance and Budget on October 26th, and then our Land Use and Transportation Policies uh, webinar on November 2nd. And all of these are on a Thursday at 2 p.m. for the next few weeks to make that easy to remember. Every Thursday at 2 p.m. we have something. Um, the third item is to save the date on Saturday, December 2nd, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. for our General Assembly preview. These are our regional watch parties around the state that will help us prepare for the General Assembly process at the start of next year. And speaking of preparing for next year, make sure to bookmark our General Assembly Advocacy Guide to see our upcoming events and actions. We'll be updating in real time. Uh, our General Assembly 101 training video, an overview of Virginia's legislative session, and common FAQs about Virginia's General Assembly process. With that being said, thank you so much again for everyone who has stayed with us through this whole time, and feel free to share this recording far and wide so everyone can learn what policies we are pursuing in the upcoming year. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you, VCN.